Welcome to Hello Happiness, the podcast that's all about positive emotions, brought to you by Welcome Collection, a free museum and library. I'm Badisha, I'm a broadcaster and filmmaker. Over five episodes, I'll be dancing alongside you all the way from hope and joy to resolve and ecstasy with a moment of tranquility partway through. We meet fascinating people, hear their happy thoughts, find out what their happy place is, and I promise we all emerge with new understanding and smiles on our faces. Wherever and whenever you're listening, thank you for joining us. Here at Welcome Collection, we like to connect up science, medicine, life and art. So let's get started. The theme of today's episode of Hello Happiness is hope. But before we let the hopeful feelings flourish, I first want to lay the groundwork and check in with a happiness historian, Tiffany Watt-Smith director of the Centre for the History of Emotions based at Queen Mary University of London. We met on a gorgeous sunny day by the Thames River in London and I asked her what we mean by happiness. The word happy originally comes from a Scandinavian root, hap, which means sort of luck or circumstance. And we still have that, like happenstance or happy coincidence. Now we tend to think of happiness as something that we can pursue, that's something that we can kind of make happen for ourselves, even that we have a sort of duty or an obligation to try and be happy. Whereas I think originally happiness is something that you're lucky if it kind of passes in your direction. You know, it's a sort of a matter of chance and good fortune as much as it is sort of engineering, which I think is how we see it today. In your book of Human Emotions, you talk about how nobody ever really felt emotions before about 1830. Now, obviously, you're not saying that (laughs) before then everyone was unhappy and depressed, but what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that before the 19th century, people didn't say the word emotion. People spoke about having passions, about having moral sentiments, about having affections of the soul. These are like completely different ways of thinking about what happiness or fear or grief might be. The ancient Greeks thought that a kind of malicious anger could be carried on an ill wind. Uh, The early Christians who lived in the desert thought that a kind of certain kind of despair could be carried by demons who kind of whizzed around the monasteries and deposited this feeling in the monks. So there's very different kinds of explanations of these feelings. Charles Darwin was very influential in our contemporary understanding of emotions and the development of emotions. How did he begin to explore this field. Darwin's book The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals, he published that in 1872. He's already got this instinct that there is some continuity between the emotions of humans and the emotions of animals and that there's some sort of equivalence between the emotions that he recognises in England and the emotions of the people that he's meeting all around the world on his journeys. So when he comes back to England he starts corresponding with travellers, ethnographers. He's really interested to know whether people all around the world have the same kind of emotional responses as he's familiar with. And, you know, he's really pleased to discover, yes, they do. And the expression of the emotions in man and animals is is a very radical book. In some sense, it's kind of more radical than the origin because it makes this very deliberate argument all the way through that the fact that human and animal emotions seem to exist on a continuum really gives very clear evidence that we are descended from animals. As we're talking, we're surrounded by the world's happiest dog that is so happy that's literally running circles around us with its eyes sparkling and it seems to be smiling directly at us. What's the consensus now? Are there five or six hardwired, very common, very universal states of emotion that really translate across cultures? I don't think there are, and this idea is very alluring that all emotions can be sort of boiled down to these archetypes. Um, I think the actual reality of our emotional lives is just so much more interesting than that. Our emotions kind of bleed into one another. They, They have these kind of strange, amorphous moments where one can be both laughing and crying. Emotions can differ quite dramatically across the world so that some people can seem to experience emotions that we don't necessarily have a word for in English. I think all of these things point to the fact that what we need to do is to think in terms 
of a much more finely grained approach to our emotional lives. These days we're encouraged to be happy and enjoy ourselves and be our best self, whatever that means. Was there ever a time historically where people were encouraged towards the opposite, towards developing their sadder, more reflective, more melancholy dispositions? There's that Samuel Johnson quote, isn't there? Life is everywhere to be endured and little to be enjoyed. So... (laughs) This is a very sort of stern and kind of uncompromising view of what life is. But, I mean, he's writing at the cusp of this big change where suddenly people are interested in contentment and satisfaction and happiness. But I think before then, there is this real interest in sorrow as a virtue. And it's part of the of the Christian way of thinking about what our experience in the world is versus what our experience in the afterlife might be you know and our experience on earth is to live in a veil of tears you know it's to suffer because christ suffered because our experience of life is is suffering these days governments prize happiness so much that they even have a sort of index or measure for the happiness of their citizens the eu has been doing this since around 2003 when did happiness become something that could be legislated for In the 18th century, there became a kind of very different sort of idea, which was to do with seeking happiness that was making sure that your experience in the world, in the present, was going to be enjoyable and that you were going to be able to, in the words of like today's self-help authors, you know, feel self-actualized. By 1776, when you've got the US Declaration of Independence, you've got Thomas Jefferson talking about the right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness i think this word pursuit is really interesting it suggests that that happiness can be something that can be kind of hunted down and and caught you know this is something that we have a right to try and get in in our own lives now i mean we don't all have the same ability to have a right to happiness now i mean clearly with the, the social injustice that we have in this world we don't share that but this sense that this is part of what we are entitled to i think is really interesting We are encouraged to aspire to be happy these days. Happiness is supposed to be a goal for us. And when you reach happiness, that's it. You've done the right thing. Can happiness really be controlled and generated and planned for like that? It's not like climbing up a series of steps, is it? I really don't think so. I think this is one of the big issues with what we think happiness is today because we tend to treat it like a condition whereas if we treated it like an emotion we would I think be better off because we would think of happiness as being something that's fleeting that exists alongside all kinds of other emotions rather than a kind of goal and a kind of overarching sort of mood sometimes it can be hard to use the word happiness because it is such a large word but there are all these tiny kind of moments within our lives you know loads of them which create these kind of positive feelings that create a feeling of warmth a feeling of belonging a feeling of trust you know all these things which are so crucial for us to feel part of our relationships with other people and and if we learn if we you know if we learn to identify these particular moments maybe that's more useful to us actually than talking about this big word happiness that I think for me anyway it kind of makes me freeze but I can absolutely talk about that moment of pure joy when I know that someone has thought about me and someone's left the light on for me when I'm coming home in the dark the more precise we can be about these moments I think the easier it is to talk about happiness overall. We're talking about happiness as a kind of internal emotional state. I'm interested in the idea of social happiness. Are there external factors such as economics, politics, maybe even fashion and design, which all conspire to make us feel happy? I mean, if we were having this conversation in a scrapyard... (laughs) It wouldn't feel as happy making as what we're doing now. I don't know, maybe, maybe. I was just thinking about this, isn't that a great German word, ruinenlist, which is the pleasure that you might get around crumbling old buildings, yeah. you know. There may be someone for whom a scrapyard is their happy place, you know. Anyway, this question about how much the environments that we live in dictate our happiness. I mean, certainly the environments we live in, the amount of pollution that we're surrounded with, the kind of housing that we're able to live in, you know, these things significantly affect our mental health. And we actually become even more aware of that, I think, during this last year of the pandemic, where we've not really been able to to leave our living spaces and the inequalities of that have become very, very apparent. I'm so glad you mentioned the pandemic because it's the unignorable reality we've all been living under for nearly two years now. We know from research that people are indeed experiencing increased anxiety, increased depression and mental ill health. Has the pandemic affected our understanding of what it means to be happy? 
all of us have thought about the things that make us happy this year, haven't we? Because we've been trying to look after our mental health. We've been trying to think about what sort of life we want to carve for ourselves. And certainly I've been thinking about, you know, what are the kind of bare minimum requirements for me? And I noticed the things that I missed, you know, the first thing, I and mean, the first thing I did when the first lockdown was getting to open up was to get a ticket for the Tate. I mean, I was absolutely desperate to get back into a gallery and I hadn't realised how important it had become until that moment when the lockdown lifted and that was, you know, some people went to see their friends, some people <laughs> went to the pub I was straight into that gallery, you know Is that your happy place then, galleries? Happy, yeah, galleries are my happy place there's a particular set of paintings in here which I really love, which I'll always make a beeline to, and they're these huge canvases and they're just bright red, swirls and swirls and swirls of paint <laughs> so energetic and they are euphoric you know they have this kind of extraordinary ecstatic kind of feeling and I I would just go in there and just be absorbed in that kind of bright red fiery thrilling kind of colour yeah that's my happy place definitely Tiffany Watt-Smith basking in the art and the sunshine And now to hope. Just thinking about it gives you a lift, but what is it and why is it important for our happiness? Is it something we feel in our hearts, something we do out in the world, or something that doctors can measure? I spoke to anthropologist Kit Davis and neuroscientist and psychologist Lisa Feldman Barrett. A quick heads up, you may hear the chirping of Kit's lovebirds in the background. I think it is the case that hope is always social. It's entangled or entrammeled with certain circumstances. It's interesting because I've just been reading a lot about the civil rights movement, where freedom was partly defined as a goal, but also mainly definable as a practice, as a kind of choice that would open things up. Um, I think in medically as well, we find it as something that underpins the efforts that we make to be well when we're not well. All of these things are socially defined because we're social creatures. In fact, m much of our interior self-awareness, the categories we use, derive from the social world around us. Let me take that idea and, and look at it from a neuroscientific point of view. Lisa Feldman Barrett, is there such a thing as being able to cultivate hope, to go from a position of not feeling it to genuinely existing in a state of hopefulness? Oh, I think so. If you understand the way the brain works, when we're born, for example, an infant brain is not a miniature adult brain. It's a brain that's waiting for wiring instructions from the world, and not just the physical world, but the social world. So the categories and concepts and knowledge that we use are really kind of bootstrapped or wired into our brains by virtue of your experiences as we develop and even as we traverse cultures. And so if you invest energy and cultivate new experiences for yourself, it's a little bit like exercise. It actually changes the wiring of your brain, but the more you practice it, the faster and more automatic you will get at experiencing hope or whatever emotion you practice, just like driving a car or building any other skill. So in a sense, if you keep reminding yourself, telling yourself to hope, it's not new age thinking, it's not delusional, you're actually what, you're carving new neural pathways? It's not really that you just tell yourself, oh, be hopeful. It's that you're taking actions to cultivate certain experiences for yourself. So for example, you might experience hopefulness by walking along the street and seeing a weed like a dandelion poke itself out through the crack of a sidewalk because it represents the awesome power of nature to be unconstrained by humans' attempts to control it. And that may sound like a Jedi mind trick, but it actually is a really powerful thing to do if you practice it. It's like any skill. So it's not just talking to yourself. It's not just labeling. It's actually paying attention and engaging in actions that will give you experiences that you can become really expert at constructing. It's unavoidable that, that we mention that we are speaking now sort of 18 months into a global pandemic. Kid Davis, I want to bring you in here because it influences my next question. How do we maintain hope in difficult times or even in negative situations that have a poor prognosis? 
Well, very good uh, example of that, of how there are always choices in terms of how we're going to approach things, was the experience of the psychiatrist Viktor Frankl. He spent time in both in work camps and in concentration camps during World War II. And he wrote a lovely little book called Man's Search for Meaning. And the first half of it is his description of his experiences in the concentration camps. Um, you know, they had kind of like a, a cigarette economy that went on there. So inmates would do maybe extra little things and the guards would give them a few cigarettes. But rather than smoke them, the inmates would save those cigarettes and then trade them uh, to the cooks or the people serving food for something a little extra, maybe like a little extra piece of, of gristle or something to eat. And he had noticed that when a man, as he put it, started smoking his own cigarettes, that that was a really bad sign and that you had to go to the person and encourage them to uh, think about a project they wanted to finish when they got out of the camp or the people who were waiting to see them or things they had to do in order to inspire them to survive. And his point was that people didn't die because they like ran into electric fences or incited people to shoot them. They just sort of died, you know, of, and he said it couldn't exactly be put down to illness because we were all sick all the time. Um, and it had to do with people having lost sight of a meaningful thing they meant to accomplish People, he said, suffer more when their lives are without meaning. And so the important thing is to help a person find out what they think their life purpose is or to find meaning in their lives. And that once you have a sense of the meaning in your life, you spare your suffering much more lightly. We can look, for example, at chronic illnesses or at terminal illnesses of long duration where, in fact, there's a balance to be struck between the palliative care or the prolongation of life uh, versus living in the moment, in the, at the present moment, and finding uh, happiness in what's there and then just hoping for more. And I think one of the problems with the pandemic, certainly in Britain, it's been very destabilizing for people. They haven't been able to really plan things or to understand what a future might be. In some interesting way, people, I think, have smaller hopes and highly individuated hopes. You know, they, they hope to be able to go to Devon next week if they don't test positive in the meantime. I have one question left for each of you, and then a joint question, which we'll come to. Lisa Feldman Barrett, I want to talk a little bit briefly about the wellness industry or even the happiness industry. Do you think that we're being pressured to be hopeful, happy, positive in a banal sense, and that we're actually being sold false hope in certain circumstances? What I would say is that you know, if you focus a lot on happiness and feeling happy. The evidence suggests that it's really counterproductive. So often the people who are the most unhappy are the ones who are striving for happiness. Research tends to suggest that living a good life means living a meaningful life, which doesn't mean that you're always feeling pleasant and happy in the moment. And sometimes, you know, when you feel unpleasant, it doesn't mean that something is wrong. It means that you're working hard towards something important. Self-care doesn't mean buying yourself fancy outfits, expensive skincare products, you know, all of these doodads. It means really meeting the needs of your body and to some extent having a bit of equanimity about your circumstances. So um, tranquility and acceptance is kind of underrated, I think, in our culture you're listening to Hello Happiness. Stick with us for all of our episodes because we do, in fact, have a special episode all about tranquility. But I want to take some of Lisa Feldman Barrett's points and put them to Kit Davis because we're thinking about hope as a social dynamic. I wanted to ask Kit about the relevance of hope to this era we're living in right now, which is about activism and social change. How important is hope within 
the vision of transformative change for entire societies. It's critical, especially now when it seems clear that one of the things we have to do as human beings is begin to imagine a way in which we can continue to self-organize on a species-wide basis. You know, I'm, I'm old enough to have been a, a young person during the civil rights movement and I can remember when there were open occupancy demonstrations in Chicago in the 60s and King came to Chicago, the sense of jubilation that one could feel in situations that would have been dangerous or that looked politically disruptive was enormous because somehow it was like finally at last, rather than being held down by the threat of violence, it was possible to begin to challenge parameters and to feel elated that at last something different was going to happen. And we're really back in the same kind of set of circumstances now. And I just remember thinking then that it might might happen again and that I'd be old. <laughs> and I wanted to stay open to the fact that it would take a different form and to not be a person who was kind of closed to the possibilities for hope. My last question, give us your immediate answer without overthinking. The question is, what makes you happy? Lisa Feldman Barrett, what makes you happy? I think any place where I'm experiencing wonder at something much bigger and greater than me. So that can be walking at night with a symphony of crickets around me, you know, watching a toddler kind of pull themselves up and toddle and fall over for the first time. Those are moments, I think, for me of, you know, peace and acceptance. Those I think of as my my best moments. Kit Davis, what makes you happy? Oh, my goodness. Almost everything but the newspapers, but I do read the newspapers. <laughs> I thought we were asking about my happy place. I was going to say, well, I'm sitting in it now. You know what I mean? I'm. There was a certain point in my life when I realized that there was no segue between sorrow or depression or annoyance or anger and happiness, that you just had to start looking for the fun in everything. And over time, it becomes part of your character and part of your nature. And also, if you lower your expectations of other human beings, that helps a lot. So I'm pretty happy in general. My happy place. I'm sitting in it right now. Could you just quickly give us a little mental picture of where that is? I hope you're not actually occupying Izzy's dog basket, literally. No, no, but her dog basket is right behind me. And I'm sitting in the hallway on the floor with a little kind of Chinese writing table on which I put the microphone and the laptop. And Izzy is on my lap, clamped down. <laughs> and so I'm happy, but I'm often happy. <laughs> That was Kit Davis and Lisa Feldman Barrett. You're listening to Hello Happiness, a podcast from Welcome Collection that's all about the positive emotions. And now for this episode's Happy Thought. In each instalment of our series, we've asked one of our favourite artists and thinkers to explore the particular dimension of happiness we're celebrating. Today, it's performer and writer Selena Thompson on hope. In poet and novelist Ocean Vuong's collection, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, the beating of a heart is described as the body saying, yes. An affirmation of life and continued existence. Confident, gutsy, vital. I want to move across, spreading out, filtering into the lungs to think about the nature of hope. If the heart is saying yes, then I believe that it is the lungs that say, please, that reveal the interdependence of the body on the world outside of itself. Delicate, desperate, hopeful. Dependent. Google tells you, in capital, bold, highlighted letters, that it is archaic to understand hope as a feeling of trust, and instead trusses it up in the synonyms of capital, desire, aspiration, ambition. It moves it away from the present. Hope is for the event yet to come. 
Luckily, its accompanying image search counteracts this cynicism. A series of images of a single flower growing from concrete. A middle-class wildflower, working-class weed. Through a crack in tarmac, a living creature stretches up to light, to air, to wind, and other creatures that might aid its pollination. Some might say that it blooms to spread love and joy, faith and hope to people forlorn. But also, it blooms to continue itself. It has its moment, but even in having that, it anticipates the next, and in its own existence, it shares this push forward, this going on. In a similar vein, each breath we draw is a subtle act of hope. That around us is what we need to survive, that we will be able to bring oxygen, but not too much, cheers nitrogen, into the body and continue to live. Indeed, that living within the biosphere is something we want to continue to do, something worth doing. Author Adrian Marie Brown's books, Emergent Strategy and Pleasure Activism, were big influences on me for a time, and I think they hold hope, hope as a trust at their core. Adrian Marie Brown advocates pleasure, advocates for finding ways to do activism that are joyful and sustainable. This strikes me as inherently hopeful, deeply trusting and absolutely bound up in the passage of time and depending on those before you and after you. When we choose to make our activisms things that not only aspire for a better world, but that also say that we can live in the rich, joyful and erotic ways that embody that better world now, we trust, hope, that that gauntlet will be picked up. We hope, trust that each of us will do enough that our lives can not only be meaningful and lived with integrity, but also wellsprings of happiness. When marginalised folks remember that they were never meant to survive, but that the seeds were planted so that they might, we step outside of time and see the hope trust that brought us into being and continues to sustain us and we see how living authentic lives ourselves might plant further seeds. Trusting hope, hoping to trust. If happiness is the desire and capacity to live whole, then I think hope is a whisper that reminds us that wholeness needs others and that needing others inherently requires trust to truly bloom. I love that idea of trusting in hope. That was writer and performer Selena Thompson. Selena mentioned Adrienne Marie Brown's pleasure activism. Brown's idea was that changing the world isn't just about the fight and the struggle and hard work. It's also about healing and happiness, positively envisioning a better way of living. You can't have activism without hope. To teach me what that means in practice, I got together with two inspiring young activists, Deza Gaji, who campaigns to raise awareness of climate change, and Dean Dlovu, a UK-based Black Lives Matter organiser. Fundamentally, what I try to do in my work of activism is I try to dream the brave new world and find ways to make that make sense, make it happen. Without hope, there is no dream. We dream about things we want to see and therefore we hope about them. And so when I'm organizing, you know, protests, particularly like with Black Lives Matter, I'm always hopeful for a future that is far more brilliant, far more beautiful than the present reality. So for you, is hope something about anticipating things which haven't happened yet, but you want them to happen? Yeah, I think what I would phrase it as in is about the possibility of the thing being able to become. It's about possibilities. So outside of my activism work, I make theatre. And when I make theatre, all I'm trying to make essentially is to make the impossible possible. The same thing is happening in activism where we get told, you know, that we have structural elements that impede on certain things taking place. 
I have to believe in the magic. And in believing in the magic, the magic becomes reality. I love that, uh, particularly that you bring magical thinking into this. days. I want to bring you in here. In terms of your work, what is hope to you? Personally, I find the, the word hope kind of problematic sometimes because I feel like hope has this kind of like, I hope something will happen. And it's very much a leave it to chance rather than actually enabling people to have actions that will create the world that they want to see. So normally when I talk about, you know, something that's similar to hope, I would say the idea of gritty optimism. It's the idea that even though, you know, like especially with climate activism, right now it looks pretty bleak. We're experiencing flooding. We're seeing wildfires. We're seeing quite scary stuff. But at the same time, there is this optimism that actually know that we have to have action to create the hopeful future that we have. Let me bring you up on the point that you made, because it's very easy to look at these issues and think, well, there's no hope in here. This is terrible. Mm. And to give into a kind of fatalism. How do you find positivity, perhaps even happiness within the work that you do as an activist? Bearing in mind, I'm only 21 and I've lived through a world where I've not seen a stable climate. I've always lived in climate change. But yet I've seen the alls and wonders of this world and the beauty that it holds. And that's what I hope for. And as like a young person, I kind of have to have a hopeful view on the world because if not, that's my future. Dee, I want to bring you in here. Your activism has been extremely heightened over the last 18 months, two years, and it must feel at times like a struggle, like a fight. Are there elements of positivity, hope and happiness, even when you're fighting the good fight? Yes. I like the definiteness of your (laughs) answer. I love that. Tell me more. When we were sort of organizing and creating the work for Black Lives Matter, the one thing that kept me going was the universal nature of the struggle, one. Two, the fact that different people from different walks of life all gathered together to say we will not bear witness to gross injustice and carry on with the mundane, with the ordinary. And for me, that gave me so much hope to see, you know, Black, Brown, white, what have you, all gathered together saying, you know what, we will not consume systemic racism. We will not reproduce it, replicate it. We will not let it carry on as the norm. That's potent right there. That's magic. I want to bring you up on this really elegant, fine distinction between hope and other positive, energizing emotions. Is there a difference for you between hope and optimism? Is hope not enough on its own? The way I think of it in my world is that you begin from a place of rage. Rage puts you into action, but joy and hope give you longevity. After that initial anger, you have to find ways to sustain yourself in that movement, particularly, for example, in race conscious activism. I can't stay angry forever, but I can work from a position of hope and joy forever. Let me ask you, Dee, how did you get involved in activism? Prior to Black Lives Matter, of course, I had been organizing at a very local level. Then we saw the brutal murder of George Floyd. I was scrolling on Facebook. I saw the video. I had a gutful reaction. I needed to do something. The first thing I did was tweet it. I was like, what's happening in, in the UK? Are we doing anything? What's going on? And by me putting that tweet out, people suddenly started to say, well, okay, so where are we meeting for, you know, our protest? And I was like, well, where do you want to meet? And they said, well, you organize it. So in a sense, I became sort of a de facto organizer by virtue of being the first to speak up in a sense. I went from posting a tweet on a Friday night. I think by the Sunday, we were already organizing for protests in multiple cities under, you know, the Black Lives Matter initiative. And it kind of blew up from there. I wouldn't change anything because the best way to put it is kind of like a cat. You don't choose a cat, it chooses you. This kind of work chooses you. (laughs) Days, I want to bring you in here because you are a climate activist. You're very focused on ecology and the environment. How did you get involved in this kind of activism? There was something in me that always felt really connected to nature. And I remember there's this story about this tree that grows outside of my mom's house and she wanted to cut it down. And I was so disgusted by the idea. I literally sat in front of the tree and I cried and refused to allow to cut it down. The tree surgeons came and they said, we're not dealing with this and left. (laughs) And I think that was one of the first times, like once I started to really deeply think about where did this all start for me? that I felt this intrinsic need to protect. But I would say the real activism started 
when I came to uni, I went through a few years of actually just being really angry at the state of the world, finding out about climate change through some health complications that I'd faced when I moved back to London. And then I think it was really meeting my community. I went into an XR meeting one January Wednesday evening, expecting them to not really get the enormity of the issue you face. But I did not find that. I found a community of people who love and care with radically open hearts and basically a place to hold the grief that I'd felt and the anger that I felt about the world and the state that we're in, but also a place to bring forth action. Days, I loved the way you described the the genesis of your climate activism as actually being a protective instinct. So the local council want to get rid of this tree in front of your house. And instead of seeing it as a fight between you and them, you saw it as an act of solidarity and love between you and the tree. I wanted to know if there are elements of celebration, joy, connection and pleasure in your relationship with nature. It's not an embattled position, is it? Quite the opposite. No, I think exactly. It's very much it's it's where I find time to rest, time to recuperate, time to regenerate, time to connect. Dee, I want to bring you in here. Have you found that activism in one area has actually given you strength and confidence in other areas of your life? Prior to three years ago, I was apolitical. I wasn't a person who was interested in race or race-centered discourse. But now, the person I am now, I am Black with the capital B, and you better (laughs) deal with that, and that's on you. (laughs) The confidence I have now is an awakening, yes, is fueled by anger and by tragedy and by fear, but fundamentally is driven by a becoming. It's a full blooming. I am walking in an awareness of myself. And I'm helping other people become aware of who they are and the power that they have and the beauty that is found within the crowns of their hair. Joy, that's what I'm talking about. You're listening to Hello Happiness, and we're linking all the positive emotions with the idea of mental and physical health. But I I wanted to put to you, Dee, first of all, if there are positive aspects in the process of activism, simply because you're around other like-minded people working, fighting, even struggling, hurting together, the social element that's positive within itself. Am I onto something here or is this misguided? You're onto something. It's like creating a show. It's like making a piece of theatre. There is no budget. We've got each other and we've got resources. We've got to make it work. That right there, that's what keeps us all together. That idea of like, we're in this together Your say is as valid as my say, it's as valid as her say, it's as valid as his say. Why? Because all our stories matter. Why? Because we're in this to understand each other. Dace, do you agree with that? Is there a positivity towards us all being in this together? Most definitely there is. What we're fighting for is the world that we want to live in. But what we're experiencing on the streets during a protest is the vision of that world. We learn how to love each other. We learn how to take care of each other. We learn how to feed each other. There is this feeling of like mass amount of hopes, even on in the protest. There is such amazingness in the community where loads of different people from so many different backgrounds can come together in like camaraderie for something that they love and one of my best friends from my activism is actually a 70 year old rabbi and in what world (laughs) would I meet a 70 year old rabbi as a you know 21 year old black woman in London I think that's one of the the best parts of our activism it's that openness Now, we have just three questions left and we're getting more and more positive as we go along. Looking into the future, Dee, what are you hopeful about? I'm hopeful about the fact that we won't have to keep having these conversations. Conversations we're having about race, they're difficult conversations. But if we build that brave new world that I keep talking about, we won't have to take to the street to let you know that Black Lives Matter because It will already be a subconscious awareness that Black lives matter and by result, all lives matter. Toni Morrison said that the real work of racism is that it keeps us re-explaining, 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 having the same conversation over and over again. The changes that I see now with people being more read, more articulate, more conscious, I don't have to define what blackness is to people because people have a working understanding or they're working to an understanding. Days looking into the future of the planet and of us as humans, what are you hopeful about? 
I'm hopeful that people still have the hearts to dream and to vision, especially after the last year that we've all been through. The fact that we are seeing an uprising and people demanding for more. I think that is something that's particularly quite beautiful. Now, my last question, I have to prep you a little bit. Don't overthink this. I'm just going to ask you what makes you happy. I'm so corny. My family. (laughs) I I love my family. I stand for my family. I think they've supported me through all of this, even though they think I'm particularly wacky and a little bit weird. And what scene are you imagining right now? When you say your family, what are you thinking of? I'm thinking of my family on the beach in Skegness. It was a town that I grew up in of where I first started to really love the world. And that's kind of where I always picture my happy place. Dee, what makes you happy? Sleep. (laughs) sleep is my happy place my bed is home like you don't understand I'm very passionate about my sleep because that's why I do a lot of my decision making (laughs) honestly there's no greater feeling than just putting your head back and going you know what we're done with today we'll try again tomorrow like that that's the one right there Dian Lovu and Days Agaji dreaming up visions of a better, happier world. Listening to them fills me with hope. And that's it for this episode. Let's all go out into the world with our heads held high. Next time on Hello Happiness, we focus on resolve. That's the emotion that kicks in when you hit rock bottom and you say, no more suffering. I'm going to stand up for myself. I'm going to fight. I won't just survive. I will thrive. From trauma survivors to an Olympic coach, we'll look at this most hard-won form of happiness. And if you want even more inspiration, you have until January 2022 to experience Welcome Collection's season on happiness and its free exhibitions, stories and events. I'm Badisha and this has been Hello Happiness. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it and please subscribe, spread the word, tell your friends and family, share the positivity. Hello Happiness from Welcome Collection is produced by Debbie Kilbride. Technical support and sound design by Mickey Curling. Original music by Solar. And the executive producer is Emily Wiles. We're in our happy place right now. In the studio, in the city, listening, talking, recording, communicating, connecting. I hope you get to visit your happy place in the coming days or do one thing that puts a smile on your face. (laughs) 